At the time, I was a 16-year-old female working at McDonald's. At the McDonald's I worked at, when you are on headset, where you answer people at the drive-thru, you are normally required to be at the first window to also take payment. My job position was customer care manager at the time, so my job was meant to be on front desk, but 99% of the time they required me behind the tills. So I was having a normal day, working a long shift, but having a normal working day. I happened to be on headset and first window that day. My headset buzzes letting me know there is someone at my drive through lane. I go through to the first window to answer my customer and this is how the conversation ensued. Hello, well then McDonald's, what can I get you? Oh wow, you got a beautiful voice. His voice was very grunty and husky sounding, not off-putting. We have all sorts of customers come through McDonald's every day, so nothing gave me the creeps at this point, but his voice was very recognizable. Thank you, sir. How flattering. What can I get you? Oh, well, I haven't decided yet. Can I just come around to the first window to decide? I want to see who I'm talking to. Now, we weren't very busy, and at this point, Creeper hadn't actually creeped me out. I mean, all he had done was pay me a compliment, and we quite often had people complain that they liked the face-to-face -face contact, so it definitely was not unusual to get a request like this. Uh, yes, sir, that's fine. Wow, you are just as beautiful as you sound. Thank you, sir. Have you decided what you're having? Are you an option? <laughs> I laughed this off. It was my first job, and I wasn't the rude kind of person when someone was paying a compliment. I must also point out this man must have been in his 60s. I remember he had one lazy eye that looked to the left, painfully awful teeth, and patchy, dark brown hair. At this point, I was a little bit more uncomfortable, but was still more than willing to take his order. I'll have a cheeseburger. Okay, sir. Uh, that's 99 cents. Are you paying cash or card? Without answering my question, he started asking where I'm from and how old I was, etc., but it wasn't until his last few questions that I got super weirded out. What time do you finish work? Half seven, why? I didn't finish at half seven, but half seven was the first number to come into my head when I blurted it out. I finished at eight and would probably do some overtime too, but I wasn't about to let him know that can meet you if you want. I could pick you up outside and we can go somewhere. All the while he was saying this, he had this horrendous grin on his face and keeps winking at me. I'm really sorry, sir, but I'm not allowed to meet customers outside of work. It's against our employee policy. That was utter nonsense, but I needed him to leave me alone. He carries on being insistent, but not getting the picture. I cut the conversation short. Anyway, sir, sorry to be rude, but can I have the 99 cent for your cheeseburger? Oh, yeah, sorry. So you would have seven. Off he drove to the next window. I was gobsmacked. I'd already said I wasn't going to see him. I was a little bit shocked, but was not going to go over there and give him the satisfaction of talking to me again. My coworker came to me and said, Ew, like I had a major crush on you and wanted your number, but... I didn't give it to him. He's old enough to be your dad. Anyway, I explained exactly what had happened and how uncomfortable it made me. Half past seven came and my coworker is spooked. Creeper is waiting in the car park for me, just like he said he would. He is sat halfway down the car park and you can see him just staring in. Our car park wasn't very big. It only had four rows of parking spaces, so he wasn't that far away and would have clocked me at the minute I walked out the door. At this point, I'm freaking out and head to the back of the store where hopefully he can't see me. I had to stay at the back of the store for 40 minutes before we knew it was safe to come out. Fast forward a week and Creeper is back on drive through And guess who is back on headset and that window one? I heard his voice and recognized it straight away. I was hoping I'd hear your voice again. Why didn't you meet me the other day? Just one second, sir. I'll be with you in a second. I immediately handed my headset to my manager and gave him a quick briefing of the situation. He gladly took the headset and dealt with the customer from start to finish. 
When my manager came back to let me know he had gone, he said that the creeper had been asking my name, my address, my surname. My manager said he was the most creepiest guy he had ever met, and I was never to have anything to do with him again. If he came to work while I was there afterwards, my manager would have me head to the back room while he dealt with the creep. He still always asked about me. Every time. I used to live in a townhouse by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door telling me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun. But none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out for a last wee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulb so I always took him out the front. That night it was around 11pm and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw a movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was going to try to steal stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then suddenly I see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gives me the absolute creep, so I grab my dog and go inside. I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom, which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch of my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds, which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. And like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road and and I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment. And then he is there. He's not just there. He is stopped at the top of my driveway, standing there like Jason Voorhees. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance, like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to come for me. My heart is racing so hard I can barely hear, and I'm standing there slack-jawed looking at this would-be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and windows further opening it and I see this person, this man looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He starts walking down my driveway, undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go sit on my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my dad who lives a suburb away. He answers. I whisper to him what was happening and he said he'll be there as soon as he can. I lie down in my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks. Pure fear. Not knowing what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in. What if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me, why am I lying here in the dark crying? Turn the light on, so I did. What seemed like a lifetime was probably just a couple of minutes later and my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia, so no guns and he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. He was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. We called the police, who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have. I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared living there. I'm still a scaredy cat, but reading other stories makes me realize I'm not alone and we can all learn from these experiences so that we and I know what to do if something truly scary does happen.
I was about 13 to 14 at the time. Let's start with a little bit of backstory. I was adopted by my paternal grandmother. She has a bit of an old school fashioned idea of how young people should meet and date, usually set up by parents or meeting at church. I call her mom as she has had me my entire life. For what I'm about to describe, I don't blame her. She was bamboozled. Mom and I were close with family that lived a short walk from us in the same apartment complex. In this family, living in their home was a grandmother, mother, and her two young sons that I sometimes babysat. We became close because mom is a seamstress and she did some sewing for the mother. The boys took an instant liking to me and all of us hit it off. My mom and the grandmother were close in age, both southern and seemed to have similar viewpoints on things, such as the aforementioned topic, so they spoke on the phone often. One day when the mother and her sons are out, my mom and I are at home cooking and the grandmother calls the house. She asks if I wouldn't mind coming over to cheer up her grandson. He was upset and rattled because his brother recently passed away. Mom asked all the questions you'd expect of a stereotypical old-fashioned matriarch. Will you, the grandmother, be there the whole time? How long will you keep her there? How old is your grandson? Of course, all the answers were favorable or else she would have flat out said no, but she was told that the grandmother would be watching us, that I didn't have to stay long, and that this boy was only a couple of years older than me. Mom said I should go. It would be nice of me to do something kind for a person with a broken heart. I agreed because we also recently had a death in the family and I wanted to help. I said I would go. While still on the phone, she says, No, sweetie, I may have just set you up with a nice boyfriend. On the other end of the phone, the grandmother says, I hope so. The distance between our apartments, mom could watch me walk all the way to their place. She stood in the door watching me. The grandmother stood in her door also watching. I went there and after the two of them waved to one another, the grandmother closed the door behind me, closed the blinds and fluffed my hair. I always had messy bangs and she seemed determined to fix them. My mom always did the same whenever my hair got messy. I just assumed it was one of their old lady things, thinking that a girl should always be tidy, so I didn't think anything of it. In these apartments, we had furnished basements. In ours, it had been turned to a play area or office. and theirs, a TV video game room. She took me down the stairs. I assumed this teenage boy was playing video games. Imagine my surprise when this boy turned out to be a man who looked like he could have been the same age as my dad. My dad was about 34 at this point in my life. I kind of froze, not sure what to say or think. The grandmother introduced us. She kept trying to draw his attention to me. Isn't she pretty? Look at all her freckles. She's got pretty eyes. She pulled me onto the couch and made me sit down. She said she had some phone calls to make, so she was leaving us there. The grandmother ascended the stairs, closed the door, and I was scared she may have locked it. I realized she lied to my mom. She wasn't going to watch us, nor was this guy only a few years older than me. While well, she was gone, he became agitated, wringing his hands, pacing and speaking in garbled phrases. He was sweating when he looked at me. I tried not to panic. I wanted to run, but was thinking that girls who run in horror movies all die, so I sat still and let him pace. He sat on the couch and started rocking. I tried to talk to him. It didn't take me long to realize he had some sort of developmental disability. I realized he wasn't dangerous, just very uncomfortable with a female stranger, and it was probably likely he didn't realize my age. I turned a music station on the TV. They calmed down and began singing along. Eventually, he fell asleep on the opposite end of the couch. Maybe an hour or so later, the grandmother came to check on us. I smiled and said thanks for having me, but I had chores to do so I should get home to my mom. The grandmother agreed and after telling me to come back and visit her grandson again, walked me to the door. I walked back to my apartment and hurried inside, locking the door behind me. Mom was startled. They usually called before I left their house. She looked at me and asked if the boy and I got along. That was not a boy. I blurted out instantly. She asked what happened and I said, He's old enough to be one of your biological kids. I have never seen such a look in her eyes. I'm sure she would have murdered that woman if she could have. 
She sat me down and made me relay everything to her. She asked repeatedly if he touched me and looked over me for what I suspect is evidence of assault, even asking to smell my breath. She asked one final time if I was sure he didn't touch me and if I wanted to go to the doctor or police. I said no. I don't think that young man had anything to do with it from his reaction. I don't think he even knew she invited me over. Mom gave me a big bowl of ice cream, stayed close to me for the rest of the evening as if she was afraid I was going to be taken away from her. The next morning I heard her on the phone yelling. I guess she called the grandmother and gave her an earful. I don't know what she said, but I never saw anyone in that family again. I don't know if mom was making sure we avoided them or if they were trying to avoid us. I suspect it's the latter. My mom can be incredibly scary and she's angry. Being a young woman in a merely exclusive male-dominant industry, I have plenty of stories about creepers I've encountered over the years. This particular story about this one particular creep is likely the worst yet. At the time, I was working for a steel pipe processing plant as a receiver. Trucks with 40-foot-long pipes would come in, and it was my job to offload them with a giant forklift. First, though, I had to collect the BOL from the driver. The BOL stands for Bill of Landing. It's a shipment document that has information about what's on the load, where it's going, where it's from, etc., so I would retrieve the BOL from the trucker and I would compare the sheet to the cargo and sign off on it, if everything checks out. I would see a lot of the same drivers on a regular basis. I got a lot of joking comments about how I looked too young to be driving a machine like that. A few of them asked me out, but I'm married and most of the guys respected that. So when I encountered a new driver from one of the trucking companies, it really didn't surprise me when one of the very first, if not the first thing he said to me was, how old are you? 23? I replied with a half-hearted chuckle. Are you married? I'm engaged, so pretty much. I replied, starting to get really uneasy about this guy. My wanting to make small talk or answer any more increasingly personal questions from this guy I had just met, I asked him for the BOL. Anything for you, sexy girl? Um, excuse me? What did you just call me? It's really sexy to see a girl like you driving a big truck. Now, I'm a bit of a hothead. I need to stand up for myself in situations like this or else I risk becoming a welcome mat for this kind of attention. He hands me the paperwork with the trademark creepy grin, like he was getting off on the fact that I was within grabbing distance from him. Listen, old man. As I snatch the paperwork out of his hand, I do not come to work to be spoken to like that. I'm here for a paycheck. Not a date. What? It's just a compliment. Don't be like that sexy girl. Don't call me or say anything to me that you wouldn't say to one of your male co-workers. I have a name, and it's not smart to talk to anyone like that before you know what it is. I bet it's arm candy. I signed off on his crap, dropped his copy in the mud, and went over to the other driver waiting in line, took his paperwork, and made Creeper wait about 30 minutes offloading two other trucks before I got to his. We have a safety rule that the driver must be inside the truck while it's being offloaded, so I took this opportunity to be even worse, laid in the horn of my truck, and angrily yelled at him to get in your truck. After I offloaded him, I went to my supervisor and told him what happened. Not a formal complaint, but to make him aware of everything that transpired, and let him know that the driver might end up complaining to us superiors about how long it took me to see him. My supervisor sided with me. He knows that if I lose my crap on someone, they deserve it. He knew about a few other incidents prior, so he was supportive. He told me to report anything else that the guy does that's messed up, and said he'd be willing to send someone else over to deal with that particular driver, if and when he brought another load. Later on that day, he made a funny comment about how sexy I looked in my uniform, oversized overalls, grease-stained, high, this hoodie, boots, and hard hat. I didn't wear makeup or perfume to work. I looked like and was mistaken for one of the guys on a few other occasions, so the creeper must have been thinking, oh my god, a girl, must say nasty stuff. Either way, I thought I made things pretty clear to the creeper and that he wasn't going to bother me anymore. 
Nevertheless, I wasn't keen on the idea of having to walk up to his cab to get paperwork from him again. The next day, guess who shows up with a new load? I call over the radio. My favorite driver is here. Can someone come grab his paperwork? A couple of minutes go by and one of the co-workers I get along with well drives up in his smaller tow motor to approach the driver for his BOL. I wade off to the side and take the opportunity to smoke next to my machine while I wait for my coworker to come back with the paperwork. He comes back and of course he wants the scoop on everything that happened the day before. I guess the driver asked why I wasn't there to collect the BOL. Coworker told him I was busy. Meanwhile, I was having a smoke and clear view. In no hurry to offload the idiot, I told the coworker what transpired when suddenly my coworker interrupted me. Uh, don't look, but I think he's taking pictures of you. Of course, my head whipped around and sure enough, Buddy was holding his phone up, pointing it at me, taking pictures, I assume. I scurried up into my machine, got on the radio for my supervisor. Favorite driver is taking pictures of me. Step 4. I'll call security. Do not offload him. Given the nature of what we do and why we do it, there's strict security guidelines at this place. Once a month, we had a bomb sniffer dog inspect the property. It was that big of a deal. So even if he wasn't taking pictures of me, he had no business taking pictures on the property. Security shows up and I watch as the driver hands him his phone. My coworker was there with him and later told me that the guy said he was trying out his new phone. Whatever. They didn't find photos of me or the property on his phone, but he had a few minutes to delete them. Either way, he was barred from the property and my supervisor reported him and what happened the day before to the driver's employer. I never saw him again, but the story doesn't end there. A few weeks later, another driver from the same company, nice guy that I had a good rapport with, filled me in on my favorite driver. Your buddy got canned, eh? Oh, that's too bad. Gonna miss him. Yeah, he was on thin ice because the girls in the offices were getting weird vibes from him. Always hanging around the office way more than necessary. Nothing to fire him over, though, but his police check came in. Turns out he has prior assaults on his record. Oh, uh, just lovely. So this happened a little over two years ago now. I wanted to post it somewhere just to look back on it one day and never forget the lesson I learned. It was 2016 and I had just started a new job at a motel. It was low pay, but I needed an office job. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days, I did training with the owner in the mornings. For two nights, Michael trained me. Our job was the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Nothing exciting, checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week, which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with a glass door. There was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night at about 1 a.m. I was just doing my normal check-in paperwork when a man walks in and asks if we have any rooms available. Usually if someone is sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. Without hesitation, I said, Yes, of course, just for one. And he replies, yes. So I begin creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting the air and making spitting noises, as if though he's being surrounded by flies. I try to ignore it, as far as I was concerned, it wasn't my business. So I try to check him into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key, and he's on his way. At this point in time, I could be described as very timid. I have a lot going on in my personal life so I hope you can all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door and causes me to jump. Absolutely frightened, I looked up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through and says, I can't get into my room. Why won't you let me into my room? My only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied, Maybe there's something wrong with your key. Let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplicable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. 
I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he is the one who trained me, though it was the middle of the night and he was asleep. I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back. I go into absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door and pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection when working at night. I hear the man in the office yelling, Hello? Hello? Why won't you let me into my room? You, don't you, don't you like me? Me being an absolute idiot and not standing my ground and calling the police when I'm feeling scared, I decided to take this situation on alone. I reply, I'm just on a phone, I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help. No answer. I decided to take a few deep breaths and step out of the office. The man was not there. He was in the bathroom. I started to hear him talking to himself, angrily saying, Kill her. Kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the police, he comes out and I say, Your key was broken. I'm sorry. Let me ask you to your room. He agrees, thankfully. I was wearing a long sleeve sweater with my arms down. I was able to hide my knife in my hand while holding it. I began to walk outside and he seemed insistent to walk behind me. We began making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. I was sweating from how nervous I was, continuously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room and I stop at his room a few doors down. I smile and say, Oh, that's the wrong room. This is your room. As it clearly said in the door, the whole time he was going to someone else's room and trying to open the door. I felt bad for them. I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns away. I felt bad for confiding in them about the guy, but they seemed willing to keep an eye and ear out. The next night the man came back, but I had the doors locked and told him we were all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation However, he didn't take me very seriously. I continued to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters have happened. Being on servers online can lead to a lot of unwanted attention. I'm a part of a staff team on a lot of servers, weeding out potential trolls or just people who are looking for something we do not provide. One afternoon in October, we get a new member in the server. She went by Terrence. That isn't her real name as people make up screen names to go by for privacy reasons. She created her introduction and gave her age as we have channels for adults to talk more freely without worrying that they might say something wrong in front of a minor, only being 15 years old. I gave her the roles and let her chat in the channels we offered for minors freely. Things started to get weird when I started posting selfies of myself without any cosplay gear on. No wigs, no colored contacts, no fancy outfits, just me. Now, I'm gender fluid, so I flip from feeling masculine and back to feminine. I have my hair short on the sides and longer up top and stick up the top of my hair. Just so I can have the best of both worlds and feel comfortable. Terrence complimented me. I thanked her, as I would with any other compliment. Yet she got more involved with complimenting me. A few weeks later, she began to PM me about how she loved how I looked. I again thanked her and kept interactions brief as I felt uncomfortable with someone three to four years younger than me complimenting me all the time. Then she started to message me every day, from 6 a.m. in the morning to 10 p.m. at night. She started to save my selfies and make edits of them, fancying up the look on them and then sending them to me. She started to ask for my Snapchat and my other accounts that I only use for really close friends. I, of course, denied giving it to her. At first, I was weirded out. Okay, odd. I kindly asked her to not save my selfies without my permission and please to not make edits of them as it was kind of creeping me out. I only knew her for about a month and she's acting like I knew her for five years. She apologized and said that she wouldn't do it again. There, that was the end of that. However, a few days later, more staff members on the server started to message me that Terrence was talking about me to other members who brought it up with them. 
She had begun to complain to other members about how I wasn't online all the time and began to share my personal private messages and even more selfies of me that she edited with other people. I didn't give her permission to do any of this, and so I confronted her, demanding her to stop this nonsense before it goes too far. She again apologizes and started to go on about how she was the worst, basically guilt-tripping me into forgiving her. I didn't fall for it and told her bluntly. There isn't much of an excuse to the actions you had with other members either. Those kinds of actions put a damper on how people see you, and when I know you as a person who does that, then immediately attaches to me, it freaks me out. Now please stop messaging me. Do not have any contact with me anymore. Her response was nothing more than, Oh, okay. I'm done with life anyways. Then it went even further. She didn't stop and her messages got more aggressive, saying that I was the reason why she was having an identity crisis and how she wanted to be everything that I was, how she wanted to end her life if I didn't talk with her. I started to get really freaked out and we got rid of her. We banned her from the server and I demanded that she leave me alone. Friend request after friend request came flooding in over the course of weeks. I blocked her each time to get rid of her. She started to join other servers that I am involved in just to get in contact with me. Many of my friends who were on the staff team ordered her to leave me alone and to never have contact with me again. She said she was sorry and that she'd try again when this whole thing blows over. I sent my last message to her stating clearly what I wanted to happen in this situation. Are you joking? Well, part of leave me alone don't you understand? You're practically stalking me now. Let me make this clear, yet again, I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone, you creep me out. Don't ever try to contact me again. That doesn't mean in a few months, it doesn't mean tomorrow. It means never contact me, ever, again. Nothing happened for months. I was on edge, but relieved that it was over. I went on with my life and started college. The relaxation came to a sudden stop one day. I got friend requests on my personal accounts on social media. These accounts that I didn't have linked up to any sort of account I use for business or my animations. She messaged things that I have never told her. She said that she wanted to meet up at Tim Hortons that was on a main street near my house. She even named the street. I always said that I was from Canada, but never gave the province or town I lived in. This was when it got worse. She started to harass my real-life friends to get her in contact with me. Every day, this 15-year-old would harass everybody I knew, including my own mother. She wanted to be in my life, but I wanted her out of my life. And then, it just stopped. Not too long ago, she tried to send me another friend request, and I blocked her once more. Hopefully, the situation is done. Two thousand seventeen was a strange time. While working night audit at a motel, I experienced the strangest individual on a weekly basis. The motel office was a large detached building with mostly windows and a glass door. I had security cameras of the building along the rooms and along the back side of the building. It was the midst of summer and I was working on some paperwork at about midnight. I peeked up at the furthest window in the room near the breakfast buffet and noticed someone quickly move out of my view. I got a vague glimpse of a white-haired man but didn't notice anything on the security cameras. I swiftly locked the doors. I didn't usually keep them locked because my boss encouraged me to take as many walk-ins as possible. A few months rolled by and I hadn't experienced anything of that white-haired man again. It was soon August of 2017. Late one night at about 1 a.m., an older man comes in. I thought perhaps he was a guest, but begins blabbering. Hello, uh, my name is John, and you probably already know me. I, I'm so sorry. I can't believe you saw me. I must have scared you so bad the other night. I looked at him puzzled. He was beginning to freak me out, so I asked, What are you talking about? He looked a bit surprised and explained, a few nights ago, you were walking up to your car, and I ran past you while naked. It's hard to explain. I was pretty creeped out at this point, but I humored him and let him ramble on, but didn't say much. He explained that on the weekends, he liked to run around town naked as an adrenaline rush. 
He then said something that creeped me out even more than ever. I noticed you've been working here six months or so. Sorry I never said hello before. You work quite a lot compared to the other girl. This strange naked man has been watching me every weekend for six months and I never knew. Admittedly, I wasn't always the most alert on my phone, on my laptop, taking a swift nap. But six months and I never noticed a naked man running through the parking lot. This began a routine of him coming back every weekend, offering me gifts or, as my friends called them, bribes not to call the cops. He would come in every weekend and talk to me before his nightly streaking and bring me expensive candy or wine. It was strange how a little too expensive these gifts were, but he was a single old man with a good job. Soon October rolled in, and just like any weekend, he comes in and chats me up, grabs some coffee I usually made and asks about my week. He then explains he's going out for some drinks at a neighbor's house and that he wanted to give me a bottle of champagne he had in his fridge. Being nice like I always tend to be, I agreed and thanked him. About two hours passed and I hear a tap on the window. It's him. But he's completely naked. I looked on the camera and no doubt about it, he's blatantly standing in front of the office, naked. He keeps tapping the window and holds up the champagne for me to come get it. But of course, I'm very creeped out. He set it by the front door and waved. I thought he had left, so I walked out to grab it before a guest saw it laying there. But in fact, he did not leave. He stood there naked and trying to talk to me. I covered my eyes and said, Uh, thanks. I'm going inside now. But next night he comes in and apologizes to me profusely, saying he had too much to drink. And being so embarrassed, I never saw him again after that. I wasn't sure if he was scared to talk to me because I didn't want to see him naked, or if he got arrested for running around naked. Because I worked there for so long, I get free rooms any time I come to visit. So, next time I come to that motel, I hope to never see that strange naked man again. After putting it off for the last few and busy days, I decided to go to my local grocery store at around 9pm last evening. My dad was at my house fixing a few things and my two children were already in bed. As any single mom would agree, getting to go grocery shopping alone is a rare treat and I jumped on the chance when dad suggested I go while he was helping out. Once I get to the store, I quickly realized that I picked a great time to go. Parking lot was near empty and once inside, I only saw a handful of store co-workers chatting at one of the registers in front. But another customer in sight, Glory B. About halfway through my shopping, I noticed another customer, first one I'd seen. He was an older dude, gray around the sides and wearing what appeared to be hunting gear. Boots, camouflage pants, and a matching jacket. Hat was also camouflage, but a different type than his other clothing. I remember noticing his outfit right away, but didn't think anything else of him. As I made my way through the aisles, I kept noticing this dude would end up in the same aisle as I was. It seemed as we're the only customers in our smaller local store at the time, so I thought, how weird that this guy is in the same aisle route as me, in an amused manner. But as minutes went on, I began to notice that this guy wasn't actually taking items off the shelves. He didn't have a cart. He had a basket, and that basket was empty. Every time I'd glance in his general direction, he'd snap his head down or to the side, making it blatantly obvious that he was staring at me. I was starting to be a bit weirded out, but thought I was being paranoid. Reminding myself that I have seen a few employees want to enter the store, so it wasn't just me and camel guy in the store. I continued my shopping. As I am finishing up, I kind of rounded the corner into the very last shopping aisle before the registers. This is where I got thoroughly creeped out. The guy was standing in the center of the aisle. He wasn't facing either side where the products lined shelves, but facing up the aisles, so when I rounded the corner, he was directly facing me. What really, really scared me was that he was smiling. Not just any smile, though. It was this terrifying, wide grin and he was frozen in that position. Dead center of the aisle about midway through with a wild smile on his face and not moving a muscle, like a statue. 
I looked at him for what felt like an eternity, but was in reality probably only a few seconds. My brain just couldn't comprehend what was going on here. There's no way that I'd be getting past this guy without having to interact or at least say excuse me. Freaked out, I quickly turned my card around and decided to make a beeline for the cash registers down a different aisle. Forget English muffins and pitas, I wasn't bringing those home tonight. As I get to the registers and begin unloading my groceries onto the belt, the woman standing at the end of the register in the bagging area looked up from her conversation with the cashier and calmly, sweetly asked, Is everything all right? I'm guessing I looked white as a ghost or like I was going to hurl or something. Just as I opened my mouth to describe the man acting strangely in aisle 12, loud footsteps, running footsteps, in conjunction with the weirdest, most guttural type scream I have ever heard. It sounded almost like a howl. I wish I knew how to properly convey the sound through text and it's the guy. Out of the corner of my eye, I see that he's running down the front area of the store behind where the baggers stand and people leave. Here's the kicker. He stops in his place about four to five feet behind the bagger, who is now also staring at this guy along with the cashier, stops yelling for a moment, and just blankly stares. No words, just an abrupt stop to the scream or yell. Stopped dead in his tracks and just stared in our general direction. He had a weird look in his eyes. I pulled my phone out at this point because, truthfully, I didn't know if this dude was on drugs or what he would do next. The cashier was frozen in confusion herself from the look on her face. Then, just as quickly as he stopped, he started screaming again and started running again. Ran right out the doors of the store. Another cashier got out from behind his register and kind of followed his path, looking out the front window into the parking lot. He turned around and said, I don't see him anywhere. This would have only been mere seconds after he ran out the doors. That same cashier walked me to my car, helped me unload my groceries and watched as I drove away. It was clear he was just as shaken as I was over the howling and the guy's action in the front of the store. I told him about how I had seen that man frozen in a big weird smile just before coming to the registers and he visibly shivered. It's taken me until this morning to truly realize just how strange the whole situation was. I'm a 16-year-old female and my family recently adopted a one-year-old dog from the shelter. We live near a park that has a small enclosed area for dogs. I started taking my new dog to the enclosed area and he enjoyed it a lot, so it became an everyday thing. I've been taking him to this park for a few months now. I've never seen anyone weird there. Then again, I've never seen anyone there at all. Most likely because I got there right before the sun sets. I know that's probably dumb for me as a young girl to go to a park alone when it's near dark, but I live in a relatively safe area and I've always been super cautious, trusting my gut if I see something weird going on. Plus, my dog is super big and quite intimidating at first glance. The day to this happened, I took my dog to the park like normal. I got into the enclosed area, shut the gates, and sat down as my dog started snipping around doing his own thing. I was scrolling through my phone when I glanced up, noticing my dog was intently staring at something in the distance. I thought he may have seen a rabbit or something dart by and try to get his attention, but he wouldn't budge. I rolled my eyes and continued looking at my phone again. Seconds later, I heard my dog growling lowly. Even though he's big and sort of intimidating, he's never been a guard dog. He never barks and definitely has never growled, so we just thought he's not that kind of dog. So when I heard him growl, I knew there was definitely something up. I looked to see what he was staring at, and it was a man in the distance. As he got closer, I noticed how weird he was acting. He was looking up at the sky and was shouting and biting at the air. He was also swinging his arms around. He sort of acted like one of those crazy zombies from the video games or movies. I felt super uncomfortable and started getting extremely nervous. I didn't think he noticed me and decided it was time to leave. I approached my dog to put his leash on, but he dodged me and started running around, his eye on the man the entire time. I quietly but sternly said his name, but he wouldn't stop running around. I started growing more nervous. 
The man still didn't notice us, but I was worried he would with all the noise my dog was making. Then, exactly what I didn't want to happen happened. My dog started barking extremely loudly. The man snapped his head towards us in the creepiest way possible. He was facing away from us, but when he heard the barking, his head just moved in the quickest way possible, his body still facing the other way. He stared at us for what seemed like forever and then started walking towards us. His walk was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. His upper half was extremely stiff and slightly turned away while his feet were hastily dragging on the ground. He was staring at us the whole time. I don't think I ever saw him blink once. I was now yelling at my dog to stop running and to come here. He still wouldn't listen and I knew I couldn't just leave him there. I finally was able to corner my dog. I put on his leash, opened the gate, and ran. My dog was pulling so hard trying to go towards the guy. The guy was also getting closer and closer to us. I had no idea how. I was full on sprinting and this man didn't even once lift his feet off the ground, just dragging them. He then began shouting again. His eyes were open so wide I thought that they were going to bulge out of his head. He opened his mouth wide and I didn't even think it was humanly possible. I just remember the way his teeth looked. They were rotted, most of them a disgusting brown shade. I continued running, losing him when I got in my neighborhood. I ran into my house and locked the door. I peeked out all the windows, but didn't see him. That night, as I was going to sleep, I began to hear shouting, the same shouting from the man earlier that day. I ducked down below my window and glanced out onto the street. I saw him. He was in the middle of the street, dragging his feet along. I crawled back into bed, even though I knew I wouldn't sleep that night. This happened to me back in 7th grade and my memory of this occurrence might be slightly fuzzy. My day started out like any other. I woke up groggy and half awake and wasted half my energy slipping into my clothes. I got the rest of my routine done and everything was fine, grabbed my backpack and headed into the car with my 6 month pregnant mom, soon to have my sister. My brother had to go to school at a later time than me as he was still in elementary so my dad, being the jobless couch potato he is, stays behind to watch the house. He usually sees us out and opens the gate for us to drive out. Now to explain the layout of our garage and driveway, trust me, it will hopefully answer a question you will have that I don't want to answer later. I have a back porch with a back door that leads to a garage on the side of the house. We have a gate so nobody simply waltzes into the back of our house, obviously, and this gate leads to our actual driveway and then out to the street. Now, when my dad opens the gate and my mom drives out, then we notice a car parked on the street past the corner of our driveway. We couldn't see them as they were angled to where a house and front plants blocked view on the side of the street. As soon as my mom got into the driveway and my dad closed the gate, this car blocks us into our driveway. Three men hopped out of the car dressed in what seems like police clothing and started banging on the windows of our car. Two of these men are armed with police batons, and one has what seems like a handgun. The man with the handgun is demanding for us to unlock the doors and get out, all the while pointing the gun at my pregnant mother. My mom actually works in our school system here and knows well enough what the police uniforms look like and did not oblige to their demands, simply saying in shock, You're not cops. You're not police. You're not the cops. One of the baton men are banging at my window, and the last of the three is screaming at my dad to open the gate. My dad scurries back to the house since, one, he's naked, and two, the man with the pistol moved from my mom's window to screaming at him and pointing the gun at him. Now another man I did not address was the car's driver, who was still in the car. For some reason, he moves the car slightly forward. And this gives my mom the golden opportunity to absolutely deck the gas and book it out of the driveway. The three men flee to their car and my mom, like a madman, swerves the car and starts chasing the men's car since we didn't get a license plate. My mom calls up the police and starts frantically explaining the situation. So my mom is chasing this car for a good five minutes out of the neighborhood and into a traffic-heavy main street. 
The car we were chasing nearly crashed into a ditch while we were chasing them, but thanks to their slow speed, they were able to change direction quickly and book it away, and my mom lost sight of them after they blended back into other traffic. I think I was the only one to get a good look at the license plates, but even then was only able to remember about three characters. Since they escaped, my mom really didn't know what to do other than to send us back to school and hopefully pass this day somewhat normally until the police come after school and ask us for details. I go by most of the school day until one of my friends notices my shaken up mood and asks what's wrong. I completely break down in class and cannot hold any tears back. I get home from school and, later, the police come and ask for more details, yada yada. I give them about the only three characters I remember from the license plate and that's about all the important parts I can remember. I'm surprised I've been able to live this moment down as three lives could have been lost, one not yet even having a single moment with their family. So, I really don't know who to thank other than the other driver's idiotic mind and my mom's quick thinking for us still being alive.